Welcome all. We're super excited to share today. Happy Tuesday. Uh, lots of updates and a, uh, a news information storytelling. Um, this is a fireside chat around the shifting dynamics uh, that are happening within gender identity and our community. Um, HMI or the Hedrick Martin Institute <clears throat> is, is proud to support LGBTQIA plus young people from 13 to 24 and quite frankly beyond. We have an incredible community of board members, both current and past staff and young people that we serve. And today's conversation will illuminate the stories that we share specific within the transgender community. Unfortunately, we know today that from 2018 to 2022, anti-LGBTQIA state bills have grown five times, which is a horrific statistic. And we also know that we learn about ourselves, we educate our community by hearing, experiencing, and understanding more deeply the stories of humans. So today's conversation led by Irene and a very special guest that Irene will introduce is all about that. It is amplifying and sharing stories so that we can be more inclusive and create intentionality around belonging for all within the LGBTQ specifically T portion and uh, perspective of our community. And so without further ado, we hope that you will continue to support HMI and support the work that we're doing. There are plenty of ways to get involved, donate and be a part of our community. And so please feel free to join our cause uh, and I will pass it to Irene to take it from here. Well, thanks, Josh. Hello, everybody. Keep your chat on because I'm gonna put you to work in just a moment. Um, I am Irene, I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I do a little bit of dabbling in DE&I, a little bit of HR, and a lot of storytelling. So that's what we'll be doing today. Uh, so thanks for joining. So first off, we're going to start, uh, I think Josh actually alluded to belonging, right? So uh, diversity is kind of who's in the mix. Uh, inclusion is how we work together. Truly belonging is when we feel like we can be ourselves at work, all of ourselves, not just the uh, the work persona, if you will. So we're gonna start with an exercise uh, that shows us how to be more, more vulnerable at work and how to show the human sides of who we are. And you're gonna use the chat in just one moment. All right, and by doing that, that's how we reach true belonging. So I'm gonna start. Uh, it's a little exercise called I am or I am from, either one works. And I'm gonna share some things about myself. Uh, and then I'm gonna ask y'all to share just one thing that maybe you've never shared before. All right, and we'll do that in the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So I'm Irene, as I said, I am from a family that has generational mental health issues. I'm from a family with substance and alcohol abuse throughout it. I am biracial. I am uh, one of the less than 5% of moms in the world that are like me. I have three kids, I have four grandchildren, and I've been married almost 39 years. So those are my I am froms. As you can see, a lot of these things are invisible about me, right? You can't always see mental health, you can't see substance abuse, you can't see anymore that I am biracial. Although you could when I was a child, I was called chink every single day from kindergarten to uh, senior in high school. Right, so many of the layers around us are invisible, right? So without being vulnerable and sharing, we never know those things about each other. So we never truly feel as if we can belong with our true selves. All right, so we're gonna go jump in the chat. Oh, of course, of course. So we're gonna jump in the chat and just put one, one thing about you that maybe you've never shared before. Thank you, 100 first cousins, oh my goodness, some depression, uh, a new parent, um, adopted, 
right? So all these things, so please keep them coming in. All of these things are really invisible, right? You might never know it unless you have these conversations. Uh, mental health issues in my family as well, history. So I call that generational. I think I made that word up, but it is generational for us. So thank you for that. One of the things uh, when we show our own vulnerability, if we show it at work, others will show it too. So I highly recommend this exercise, whether it's in a team meeting or if you have huddles or uh, morning coffee with folks, share your I am froms and see uh, who you might find that has, you have more in common than you might have known. So thank you so much for that. All right, so we're gonna do some magic now. Uh, I, I always say we hope. So I'm gonna try and share a video. Let's see how that goes. Being transgender, I haven't always been proud of who I am. I remember when I first realized that I was trans, I just sobbed. I never thought that my family would accept me, so I did my best to keep my true self a secret. Day to day, nobody could really see the struggles that I faced inside, and the only time I even let myself get a glimpse of the real me was when I knew I was alone and could experiment with makeup. Makeup was a tool for me to access my feminine side, to escape the confines that my birth sex kept me locked in, and to figure out who I really was. For months before I transitioned, hiding in the bathroom with my mom's makeup was the only point of my life that I liked. It was the only time that I really felt like me. But despite how amazing I felt in that moment, I knew I'd eventually have to wipe it all off to ensure that nobody found out. I attended my first Pride in the Closet as an ally to my friends. It was liberating to see everyone so unapologetically themselves I was jealous, and eventually my secret instances in the mirror weren't enough. So I started curling my eyelashes and wearing a light foundation to school, but I would deny any accusations about me wearing makeup and got really defensive whenever someone brought it up. I didn't want to admit it to them or myself. I worked hard learning to love myself, and now, five years into my transition, I no longer need makeup to feel like myself. I got to attend my fourth Pride last year as Samantha, and now I truly get what Pride is about. It's about being proud of who you are, despite the challenges and hurdles that life may have thrown at you. It's about saying I won to the demons trying to hold you back. And it's about being around people that fully accept you and support you for you. Now, makeup is about bringing out all the beauty that I see in myself, not just trying to find it. I finally like the woman I've become, and I'm so proud of the journey it took to get here. So thanks for indulging me. That is actually another thing that you can't see about me um, is that I have a transgender daughter. Uh, so that was Samantha. Um, uh, and she's my daughter. So I'm going to tell you, I talk a little bit about one of the things she said that I thought was really interesting is that nobody could see the struggles, right? So we just talked about things. Um, oh, thank you. She is so beautiful inside and out. Uh, so one of the things we can't see people's struggles, right? So another reason why we want to be uh, vulnerable and, and talk about things and talk about who we are in our families. Uh, so thank you for indulging me in that uh, little clip of Samantha. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my journey as a mom um, and how I got to where I am today. Uh, before I start, I think it's important for everyone to know it wasn't easy, right? So this was not an easy journey. Uh, it, you know, when I look back, it's beautiful. It's a wonderful story of learning and growth and love, but it was hard. Every day was hard, right? When we look back now, it's hard to even remember um, who Sam was before Sam became Samantha and truly uh, is living her life. So our journey started, although we didn't know it, when Sam was probably three or four years old. Interestingly enough, every trans person I talk to will tell me they knew something was different about them 
sometimes even saying they knew something was wrong with them since age four, right? So most trans people can uh, recall back to age four, knowing that uh, there was something about them that wasn't quite right. Uh, so we knew pretty early that there was something with this kid that was different than the other two. Um, and it came out in health, right? So, so when we have kids, oh, I just wanted health and happiness and safety for my children. And with this one, we saw belly aches and headaches, very, very sensitive child, a very abstract thinker, very, very young. So I knew there was something, <clears throat> certainly did not know what, right? So grammar school, you know, we start to see more signs. I knew there was something, but I didn't know quite what it was. For a while, I was sure <clears throat> that this kid wanted to be a cowboy. They loved bandanas and they loved cowboy boots. So I was sure we have a cowboy, right? So, so that was elementary school. So already belly aches and headaches and things uh, with health that were bothersome as a, as a parent. If we fast forward to junior high school, um, we realized then that Sam's friends were all girls, right? Sam only had friends that were girls. Sam never had a sleepover, right, at anybody's house. Um, and, and in junior high, it's when boys, uh, at least in the in the day, right, found other boys and girls found other boy uh, girls, and that's how they kind of clicked off. For Sam, she didn't fit, so it was very very lonely. There was a lot of bullying, um, and and Sam just didn't know how to navigate. Um, that space. Did we know why? We, we didn't. We didn't. We started to see some depression and anxiety um, in that kind of middle school uh, stage, you know, thought it was related to bullying and things like that. So we did, we kept an eye on it. Uh, again, we do have some generational mental health uh, tied to both depression and anxiety. So we, we kept a close eye. In high school, uh, Sam did find a wider group of friends, right? So, you know, you go from a small kind of um, town um, uh, junior high to a regional uh, high school in, a, in our system. So many, many more kids. So definitely found a broader group of friends, both boys and girls, but she was still struggling, right? And a mom can see that, right? Still struggling a little bit on the inside. Uh, but you could see some of it on the outside. For my husband and I, when fear really set in um, was when we realized she was experimenting with cutting. That's when the mama bear and me really kicked in and um, knew I had to do something to help this child. So what do you do? You get folks into counseling and that's exactly what we did. We worked with our pediatrician and we found a good counselor uh, that could help us, right? Uh, understand where this was coming from uh, for Sam. Therapy helped, right? So around probably junior year in high school uh, is when Sam, we were sitting in the car uh, right before she was going into therapy. Um, and she said to me, mom, I have something to tell you. I said, well, what is it? And she said, I'm gay. Now remember Sam was still a, a boy at this time, right? And said, I'm gay. I'm like, okay, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, I think she expected a bigger reaction, uh, probably based on uh, the way she was uh, raised, right? Because you know we had a gay kid in the household, right? So, so off we went, we, we, we talked with dad about it. Was it a difficult conversation? It was, but this was our kid, right? Um, you know, when we had children, um, and I'm sure that's the same for, for many folks out there, it was unconditional, right? So there were no ifs, right? So we never said, okay, well, we're gonna love them if they're blonde or if they're blue eyed or if they're smart or if they don't have diabetes, or if they don't have any disability, then we'll love them. There were no ifs, right? 
we had children and our promise to our children was that we were going to love them. <clears throat> that didn't change anything, right? It didn't, there was never an if. So, so right now we have this, this boy who's gay um, and I remember sitting in my room one day and, and Sam's recollection of this story is very, very different than mine. Um, somewhere in there is the truth, but I'm telling my story so you get to hear my side. Um, so I, I'm sitting there and she comes kind of bouncing into my room. You know, we thought a lot of the trouble with anxiety and depression and things like that would go away uh, now that she realized she was gay, but it didn't, right? And on this day, six words changed my life and changed who I am and changed what I do and how I do it. And those words were, mom, I'm not gay, I'm transgender. My reaction was, can't you just be gay? It would be so much easier for me, right? I didn't even really know what the T was. I, I don't think I knew the letter T in LGBTQ. I was born in the 60s. To me, a transgender person was a six foot man in a dress, right? We're conditioned to think things about people through media and television and all of those things, right? So in that moment, her life flashed before my eyes. Would she find love? Would she find happiness? Would she get married? Would she have children? How do I keep her safe when I don't even know what the word transgender means, right? So I had to learn, I had to grow, and I had to change, right? And so did my family and my friends and my neighbors, right? So Sam began her transition really at the end of her senior year of high school. Um, and as I said earlier, we have really never looked back, right? Was it really scary? Yes, right? So we live in a very tiny town in, in Massachusetts and Sam decided she would go to school in Chicago. She literally socially transitioned in the car as we drove her to Chicago. Um, uh, came to UMass after that. So I uh, finished up college in UMass, but that first year was really far away from home and really, really scary um, for us as parents. The other thing that I talked about a little is that we had to come out, right? So not only did Sam have to come out to her parents and her family and her friends, right? So did my husband and I, we had to come out to our other children we had to come out to our family, uh, potentially losing someone along the way who, who didn't uh, want to join us on this journey. I had to come out at work, right? And, and uh, I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't pretend that Sam was a boy, right? Uh, when I first uh, showed pictures of her dorm room, right? So people needed to know uh, that we have a transgender kid. Um, and we're incredibly proud of her, right? So we knew uh, that we had to change, that we had to grow, that we had to um, come out, if you will. So for our other children, um, our oldest one um, is an iron worker, right? Uh, about uh, uh, 10 years older than, than Sam. Uh, Sam was a surprise twice. Um, and he had two questions. I guess she shouldn't be the um, best man in my wedding, which was coming up. And we said, no, she would probably prefer uh, to be a bridesmaid, which she was. His next question was, can she have sex? And the answer was yes. And he said, well, then I'm good. And off he went. Our, our middle daughter, who's about eight years older than Sam, said, I think it's my fault. And I said, what, what do you mean, Kayla? What do you mean it's your fault, right? I played with her an awful lot when she was a baby and we played with girls' toys. I, I think it might be my fault. And here when we're live, right? So when Sam and I do this live, I'll usually look at her and say, so is this contagious? Are they gonna catch being trans? 
Of course not, right? And and my middle daughter could not make Sam trans. Sam is transgender. Sam has gender dysphoria, right? So no, no one could make her transgender and no one can make her not transgender. So as soon as my middle daughter knew that it wasn't her who made Sam transgender, she too was fine, as were all of their friends, all of our family. You know, one of the most interesting coming out stories for me was uh, walking around the block with my grandson and a neighbor pulled up that I hadn't seen in six months and rolled down her window, of course, and said, hey, how are you? And uh, she said, well, hi, how are you? I said, I'm good. Sam's a girl now. Like, it just poured out of my mouth. I don't even know why. And she said, I know. I follow her on YouTube. Tristan showed me her YouTube. Now, y'all remember I talked about bullying, right, in junior high school. Tristan was her bully, right, or the leader of the pack, if you will, of bullies. And then this mom shared with me, and oh, by the way, Ireland, who was born a girl, she's a boy now. I'm like, oh, my goodness, three houses apart, and we both have transgender children, right? So if you don't share, you never know. And, you know, it's pretty lonely being the parent of a transgender kid. It's not like you go to a school committee meeting and say, hey, anybody else here got a trans kid? Because I do. It's just not how it happens, right? So the more we can be open in our communities and at work and with each other, um, the easier it is for everybody, right? So at the beginning, I shared with you um, that I thought Sam was gonna be a cowboy. So why would I say that, right? It's kind of an unusual thing to say. So what we realized looking back, right? We didn't realize at the time was that those bandanas were always around her head creating hair or around her waist uh, creating skirts and dresses. So when we look back at pictures now, we can see that Sam was always a girl, but we didn't see it then because our eyes weren't open. We didn't know what we didn't know, right? And the boots, so why the boots? So I actually had to ask Sam because they were just cowboy boots. So why did you love those boots? And her answer was, because they sounded like your shoes, mom. And if I think back, they actually did click right? When you walk in a pair of cowboy boots, you can hear them on the floor. So um, even those boots that we bought over and over again um, were a part of her uh, kind of showing us along the way, but we didn't see, right? Because we didn't know what to look for. So um, I also shared with you at the very beginning in my, my I Am From that I am one of less than 5% of moms that are like me in the world. So why would I say that? Why uh, am I so unique, right? So we believe um, that there are less than 5% uh, of people in the world are transgender. Um, again, those numbers change where they, they move around a lot. It's not like everybody raises their hand and does a demographic study uh, saying I'm trans, right? Because in some countries it is illegal to be trans and punishable. Um, sometimes by death, right? Uh, so we believe it's under 5%, right? Somewhere between two and 5%. So I am one of the only two to 5% of moms in the world, right? That got a trans kid. So to me, I won the lottery. Y'all did not, unless y'all have trans kid too. But I won the lottery, I get to raise this unicorn of a human being. Um, and I get to journey with her through that. And it has been the most amazing journey. Uh, so that is why I am less than 5%. I am the cool mom in the cafeteria. Uh, although my kids probably would not say that. All right, so today, uh, you know, I, I do storytelling just like I am on this call. Um, but the other thing I do is I believe uh, the world will change faster and become more accepting through corporate America, right? So I use this natural flair for telling stories. It's just who I am um, 
to tell them in corporations um, and to educate, right? So I do storytelling with corporations. Um, I do things to support their trans and non-binary populations, right? And help them to support them. Making sure that health insurance is where it should be. Policies, practices, facilities, right? Education and awareness, right? So I do that work with corporations from um, around the country. The other thing I do um, is I work with companies as they prepare for someone who is transitioning in the workplace. So I'm gonna say this real loud and real clear to those of you on the phone. It is not the transitioning person's responsibility to help the workplace through that transition. It's, a, it's HR's responsibility. Now that is Irene's opinion, um, but we, right? Corporate America, we need to prepare people um, in corporate environments for folks who are transitioning in the workplace, right? So the person who's transitioning, they know what transgender means, right? Um, they know that it means that the sex assigned at birth does not align with my gender identity, right? Whether I'm binary or non-binary. Um, they know what that means. They've lived it their entire lives, right? The people around them don't. So it's really HR's responsibility to create a welcoming environment where people know the right thing to do um, and the right way to, uh, to treat people who are transgender in the workplace, particularly if they're transitioning on the job. So I, again, believe it's HR's responsibility, uh, not the responsibility of the trans person. You know, I'll often get, uh, as I get into these engagements, I'll, I'll hear from the, uh, you know, I do a lot of work with the person who is transitioning kind of individually. Um, and they kind of will almost always say to me, can't I just send an email? Uh, and this is going to sound terrible coming from me, but the answer is no, because it's not all about you. It's about the people around you that for the most part want to be good humans. They just don't know how, right? They just have not learned how. Um, the other thing I do, because, you know, now I've lived this beautiful, wonderful learning and growing experience is I work with trans families, right? Moms and dads and aunts and uncles and foster parents all across the country somehow find me um, because they want someone to talk to who understands what it's like to be a mom, right? Uh, so if they find me through all different ways, uh, sometimes I don't even know how they found me, uh, but I will talk to just about anybody who wants to have a conversation um, about a family member or a loved one uh, that is trans or non-binary. It's very, very lonely, uh, particularly at the beginning uh, for a trans um, parent. Uh, and then of course, any trans people that I come upon in my life, in my journeys, in my work, I certainly um, am blessed to know many, many folks who um, I'm lucky to have lots of really um, wonderful conversations where I continue to learn and grow. Uh, particularly in the non-binary space, because my daughter is binary. She is a trans woman. Uh, so in that non-binary space, I still have a lot to learn um, every single day. All right. So we're going to try a little magic again uh, and see if we can't get another video to play. So this is like extra super duper magic if I can do this uh, more than once on one call. So let's see how this goes. Oh, I just might be able to do it. Here we go. All right, super quick video. Let's take a quick listen. Hi. No. Hi, I'm Taylor. Hi, I'm here for my interview. I'm Dorian and I use the pronouns he, him. Are you comfortable sharing how you would like to be addressed? Thank you for asking. I use they, them pronouns. Great. Oh, I'd love to hear more about your skill set. Sure. I went to school for advertising and I All right, so that one still tears me up every time I watch it. Uh, so I'm gonna ask you all a question. You can put your answer in the chat if you would. 
are you ready? Would, what would you have done in this interview? Would you have been ready for it? Would you have asked, right? Uh, gave you goosebumps, thank you. It's, it's a really favorite, especially because it's only 52 seconds long. So, um, so thank you for that, Sarah. So would y'all have been ready? Very moving. I've seen it before, I love it. I do too, I watch it all the time. I love the question, how would you like to be addressed, right? So Josh, that, that's really important, right? So we often say, like I always introduce myself with, I'm Irina, you should hear pronouns. If we ask someone, what are yours? They might not be ready for that. They might not want to share. Um, so asking, how would you like to be addressed? Is, is a, it's a little bit of safer question for folks. Um, really, really important in the workplace and in life. Right, because when we assume pronouns, right, that's when we begin to make mistakes. Um, I think we have a question coming in. Yeah, so we're, we're gonna get to those questions, Joe, um, in just a minute, and then Josh, if you'll bring that question back up when we get there. So thank you for that. We will, uh, we'll talk a little bit about those. All right, so why me? Why Irene? right? Why do I get to do this work, right? And, and what we have found, again, I never want to take work away from a transgender person, right? Because there are lots of folks out there that do uh, similar work. So for me, uh, what we have found with the, the audiences, with the corporations that we work with, is that I'm relatable. I'm just like y'all, right? So I'm white, uh, at least that's what you see. Um, I'm from corporate America. I've done this uh, corporate gig for uh, over 30 years now, and I'm a mom, right? So everyone wants to be a mom. They have a mom. They knew a mom, even if it was a chosen mom in their lives, right? Or they are a parent, right? And once you connect with me, it's really, really hard not to connect, connect with my daughter because I'm like you, right? So what we say is that I grab them, the people in our audiences by their heart, uh, and my daughter typically grabs them by their brain, much smarter than I am. So what do you say? Uh, we actually bring Sam on camera, yes? All right, let's get you on here, Sam. Samantha. Hello, 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 everybody. hi. Here, I've arrived. So y'all should know I am on vacation me. in New Hampshire. Sam is at home. And so we've been separated for a few days. Um, and I know, usually we're on the same screen, but. Yeah, today was the first time we're not on the same screen. So welcome, Samantha. Thank you for joining us. Um, <clears throat> everyone's saying hi. Yeah, welcome, Samantha. So I think people want me to come, but it's never me. It's always about Samantha, uh, who actually uh, goes by Samantha Lux um, in her uh, social media. So I'm going to ask Sam some questions, and then we'll uh, get through those, and then we'll come back to y'all uh, and see if you have some additional questions as well. So we're getting lots of highs and welcome, Sam. We truly love you. There you go. All right. All right, so Samantha, and I get to call Sam Sam, but uh, she does go by Samantha, but I'm her mom, so I get, a little, I get away with a little bit more. All right, so you just graduated college uh, a couple of years ago, three years ago in 2019, um, and today you're an influencer, right? Can you tell us why you chose that kind of work? Why it's so meaningful for you? Yeah, I mean, um, I think growing up, I just really realized that media is super powerful. Um, you know, it's around you all the time, whether you realize it or not, it's impacting pretty much how you think about everything. Um, so growing up, I, I didn't see a lot of trans people online. I didn't see a lot of trans people on TV. And the only trans people that I did see were, I'll just say not great role models. They weren't a great representation for who I felt that I was. Um, you know, it was the people that you saw on Jerry Springer that made a joke out of being trans and everybody laughed at them and beat them up. and that was kind of what I saw. So growing up, I never really realized that being trans was a real thing. So once I did discover it, it was on YouTube, actually, I should say that I, um, I actually watched a story time video, which is kind of perfect, because that's what today's all about is sharing our stories and everything. I saw a story from somebody who was transgender, and they were talking about their experiences and how they felt and what they wanted to do with their life and everything. And just you know, really being vulnerable about who they were. 
And that is when, you know, my mom mentioned I came into her room bouncing. I mean, it's not really what I remember, but um, <laughs> it was like a very sudden moment. That is something that I agree with her on. And in that moment, I just realized how powerful sharing your story can be. You know, I never, I mean, I wouldn't say I would never have known, but I don't know when I would have figured it out if it wasn't for those people that came before me and were so vulnerable online. Um, so yeah, I think that after studying media in college and, you know, focusing on the ways that it can reduce prejudice or create prejudice, I decided that I wanted to create that media that I never had. I wanted to give back to my community and give back to the young versions of, you know, myself or um, whoever is out there and would need a little help. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I try to do now. I, I talk about LGBT content. I do women's rights commentary, just a bunch of different stuff on my channel and just try to be as visible as possible. Yeah, so thanks. So we'll plug again. It's Samantha uh, Lux, uh, subscribe. I guess I'm supposed to say that right, Sam. Um, and Sam's like. been at this for a few years now. When she first came to us, when she graduated college, she said, I'm gonna be a YouTuber. And my response was, what is a YouTuber? Um, and we did say the word real when we said, well, if you're not making it within 18 months, you know, you got to pay for your car and that sort of thing. You're going to have to get a real job. Um, I now watch uh, the amount of work it goes into the work she does. Um, it's definitely a real job and she's really making a difference. So as I talked about, I am trying to change um, the world through corporate America. Sam is getting right into hearts and minds of individuals through her media. Um, so take a peek when you get a chance. All right, so let's talk a, bit, a little bit about the workplace. We have lots of workplace folks on the phone today, uh, and then we will go to questions. Um, so Sam, from a workplace perspective, what would you say, uh, it looks like we have a few minutes here, maybe 10 or so, uh, what would you say are the top five things that folks should know about uh, transgender and non-binary people? Um, and what they can do to create better uh, workplace environments. Right, okay. I mean, there's a lot, I'll just say there's a lot. So uh, I'm gonna do my best to cover the most important ones. Um, no particular order, they're all important, okay? <laughs> um, but the first one I would think is just pronouns. Pronouns are super important. You know, you just saw that little ad for, I believe it was Indeed. Um, so offering your pronouns, normalizing the usage of pronouns, you know, put it in your email signature, put it in, you know, your little name tag, whatever you, you have, um, is really going to help transgender people because it's going to create a space where people feel open to share their pronouns. You know, not a lot of trans people's pronouns are, you know, like evident right away. A lot of people use they, them, and you might not necessarily know that just by looking at somebody. So if we really want to create a very inclusive, safe environment for everybody, we should give them space to you know, be themselves and share that part of themselves without feeling like, you know, they have to challenge your perception of them. Yeah, and um, I think, Sam, what you said is it's that safe space, right? So if right. we only share our pronouns when we think there's a trans person in the room, that's not a safe space. The right. best ally is going to uh, correct people uh, when the trans person is not in the room. Right. Right. Um, and and I will add, is like, you don't know if there's a trans person there. You know what I mean? Like, you don't. You sometimes don't. it's obvious and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it seems obvious and they're not actually trans. And it's like, you know, it's it's a lot going on there. But um, yeah, and it, it, I would also say that it's OK to make mistakes. I don't think, you know, there's any trans people out there that would write you up with HR or send her like a complaint or whatever. If you mess it up once or twice, it's just it's the thought that counts. That's what I'll say. Yeah. But, um, and when yeah. you do mess it up, because you will, right, correct yourself and move on. Do not yeah. go into a dissertation about why uh, you've made a mistake, because that puts it back onto the trans person. Just correct yourself and move on and get it right the next time. Right? Yeah. And if somebody corrects you, you don't have to get all defensive, like, oh, I, I support trans people. Just thank you. He got it. Move on. Just like you yeah. said. Um, the right. next thing that I would say is just clarifying that terminology. So I'll, sometimes people get sexuality confused with gender identity, which is, you know, tran what being trans means. Um, so my gender identity is a woman. So that is what makes me trans. But my sexuality is I'm straight because I'm a girl and I like boys. Um, 
just because I like boys. It doesn't have anything to do with me being trans. That's to say that like, you know, I could like girls, I could like both boys and girls, I could like everybody, whatever. That has nothing to do with my gender identity. Um, which is exactly why when I came out as gay before I transitioned, it wasn't enough for me. I needed, um, I needed more. And a good little saying that I like to bring up whenever we talk about these differences is that sexuality is who you go to bed with, and then gender identity is who you go to bed as. And then I think there's, yeah, also we need to clarify the difference between gender and sex. So gender are those social, the social roles that you play in real life, um, you know, how you look, how you talk, how you act, all that kind of stuff. And then sex is the biological characteristics. So whether you are male or female, neither of which like, they don't really matter. They're not really your business, but um, yeah. For the third, is there anything you wanted to add to that mother? No, you got it. Oh, perfect, love that. Um, so the third thing that I would say is super, super important is to never out a transgender person. Um, you know, I think in the workplace, it's, you're, you're around the same people all the time. You're like, oh, well, did you hear what, what happened with Susie? Uh, people love to gossip. I, I'm also guilty of gossip, I won't lie. But um, it's just not something that you wanna do for a few reasons. One, it's obviously a private, you know, intimate thing that somebody might be going through. And if they don't give you that explicit permission to share that, it's just not really your place. Um, and second of all, it can be very dangerous. So when we're talking about out of the workplace, for example, if I was maybe like at a bar and somebody was flirting with me and then my friend was like, oh, did you know that she's trans? Did you know that she used to be a boy or something like that? That could put my life in danger. I could, you know, I go to leave the bar and the guy follows me out and we'll move on. Um, so yeah, it's a safety thing and it's a respect thing. You just, it's not your business. <laughs> okay, um, mother, anything you wanna add? No. Okay. I will butt in. Okay, the next worry. thing that you should always remember for workplace people that are transitioning is that transition varies widely. For everybody, transition looks very, very different. So for some trans people like myself, they choose to do the full medical transition. You know, we go on hormones, we have surgeries, we do all that. Some people may choose to just go on hormones. Some people may choose to just have surgery. Some people may choose to just change their name and just, you know, change the way they do their hair. And that's all perfectly valid. They're just as much as a of a transgender person as I am. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, so that's pretty much what I had to say on that one. Um, and then finally, I think the most important thing, actually, I guess I wouldn't be the most important. I keep, I don't know. But the last thing, finally, is don't ask the questions that you wouldn't ask other people. So I think something that my mom mentioned earlier is that when somebody is transitioning in the workplace, it's not their responsibility to educate everybody around and make everybody around them comfortable. They're there to perform a job. They're there to do their job and that's it. Um, so you, you don't wanna go up to them and be like, oh, I, I heard you're, you're transitioning. Can, can I ask you about your life experiences and you know, your doctor's name and um, you know, when you're having surgery and what's in your pants? It's, it's too much, it's too much. Um, I mean, if you have a very, very close relationship with somebody, of course, you can ask them more intimate questions as you would with any of your closer friends. But I feel like a lot of the times people think that just because a transgender person is open about transitioning, kind of like we have to be, um, they feel like it gives them permission to ask whatever they want. And that's just not the case. Yeah, so I think what I'd add there, Sam, is, um, you know, what we uh, will hear is what was your old name? Uh, can you show me pictures of before your transition? Mm, those are good ones. Did you yeah. have the surgery yet? Um, one I heard in a workplace where we helped someone transition was, um, so do you think you're really emotional uh, so much more now because you're on hormones, right? You wouldn't ask anybody that. That's like asking a woman a personal question. You can't do that. So be really, really careful about uh, those questions you're asking um, to, to, to trans folks in your lives. Right. All and right. I mean, it's, it's perfectly normal to have questions, but there's Google for a reason. <laughs> there is, right? Yeah, that's a good point, right, Samantha? Because it's not the trans person's responsibility to teach you about trans people. It's yours. And there is right. plenty of good information out there, plenty of really great websites, HRC, out in equal, there's all kinds of different places to learn, right? So uh, get the Google out. Uh, it is not uh, the trans person's job to educate you. 
All right. Is there anything else? Uh, the one thing I will say for folks on the phone is that um, underemployment and unemployment is significantly higher for trans folks. Uh, so keep that in mind when you're interviewing and recruiting and uh, trying to fill those, those positions. Mm -hmm. um, and then Sam, is there one more piece of information you would want people to know, particularly uh, since we're on this call with uh, HMI who uh, does provide services for um, trans youth? Yeah, definitely. Um, there are some scary statistics out there about, you know, mental health problems and suicidality with transgender people. And the numbers, you know, they're accurate. They're, it's a very, very hard thing to go through. But one of the statistics that I like to bring up, you know, kind of in response to those is that when a transgender person has at least one, like literally just one supportive person in their life, whether it be a family member, a close friend, you know, a, a guidance counselor at school, whoever, it dramatically reduces those chances of them, you know, hurting themselves. I think the number was like 16 out of 17 or some crazy high percentage of um, whatever. So yeah, I think that, you know, if you, if you know a transgender person, if you, um, whatever, just, just be nice. You know, you could literally save their life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'll go back to thanking HMI for the work they do uh, with young people. They are probably that one person in some cases. So thank you, Samantha, for uh, answering those questions. Um, and I think we are going to take some questions uh, from y'all on the phone. We have about 10 minutes left. Uh, and I think Josh is going to uh, try and help manage the chat for us and get those questions to us. So uh, as Sam said, you never ask a trans person that question. Today is a safe space and you get to ask it. Um, if Samantha has a question that she doesn't want to answer, she just won't answer it. Uh, so please feel really open and safe to ask questions that you might not otherwise, uh, otherwise ask because that's what we're here for today. Yeah. yeah, throw what I just said out the window for like 10 seconds, ask whatever right. you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple couple questions that have come through. Um, one is, um, how do you find organizations that are trans friendly, LGBTQIA plus community friendly? How do you do that research to um, create safe spaces for our community? So I can so take like that one, Sam. I think I saw that. Uh, was it around employment as well, Josh? Or yeah, overall. it's 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 finding those organizations that that emulate in a sense. I'll 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 put a little interpretation onto this, um, but emulate um, what happened in that Indeed commercial, so that we can we can continue to find safe places and places that we can we can thrive. Yeah. So so the first answer, because I think there's a couple of questions in there, is from an employment opportunity. Um, there are specific job fairs. So if you have an LGBTQ chamber, I know there's one in Boston. Um, I'm sure the other big cities also have LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce. They often do run job fairs. So hook up with those folks. Um, and then look for trans types of events. So there's one in January, uh, again, in the Boston area. Uh, there's one in Philadelphia. So there are all sorts of um, events for transgender folks and their families. Um, and typically there is a job fair right uh, there as well. From the outside looking in, so I'm gonna tell you, you know, I didn't know what I didn't know when Sam came to me. I'm giving you all forewarning, this is happening, right? So if you are not prepared, you can't just hang a flag in June, right? And say you're, you know, inclusive of all kinds of people, you can't, you have to show it through everything you do, right? As a corporation. Um, so it has to be in your practices, your policies, your, your health insurance, young people in particular will not come to work for you if they can't see themselves, and if they can't see their friends. So representation is very, very important from a corporate perspective. Do you think I answered that, Josh? Perfectly, perfectly. Cool. I, I, would say, I would say also to <clears throat> the group that the NGLCC, the National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce also is missing that T, but is, is certainly very, very focused on the transgender community. Um, many of the companies that work with uh, HMI are also part of that chamber and, and look them up. 
because those organizations are out there in this space to create safe spaces for lots of communities, uh, inclusive of the trans community. Great suggestion. Um, I would also, uh, sorry, I'm so sorry. Great suggestion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, NGLCC, the NGLCC, National Gay and, Le uh, and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce. Um, there is a question regarding what's happening today with anti-trans bills and, and what's going on in that space. And I, I think for many folks, especially within the work that we are all doing, HMI, Save and Connect, our sponsors, as well as Irene and Samantha. Irene and Samantha, could you share one takeaway, one something that organizations can do, an action to demonstrate support of the community and demonstrate, um, quite frankly, the, the disgust we have with what's happening within our politics today. What can this audience learn as one takeaway to take back to their organizations to support the transgender community? So I, I can take that one, Sam. Um, from a from a corporate perspective, uh, in the in the corporation that I work in, and the work I do, it, it's about um, making those calls, right, to your legislators, to whoever uh, you can get your voice out there. Um, so that's one of the steps that you can take as an organization. Maybe you have an ERG, employee resource group, or a business resource group. Uh, sometimes we will do those as a, as a group. So we'll all be dialing the same number at the same time and picking option five. And, you know, uh, we script for folks what they can actually say. Um, from a, from a, a corporate perspective, um, you know, there are ways to support um, that these, these bills and these legislative things that are happening um, are not acceptable. Um, so HRC is a workplace um, human rights campaign. That's a good place to kind of find your way into um, supporting, not supporting all these things that are going on. Um, I know that when my company signed on, we were one of only 57 companies in the United States uh, to sign on with HRC. Um, um, in making it very clear that we do not support this type of legislator, legislature. And it, you know, I think it's important, you know, people say, well, trans people are so much more accepted in the world now. Yep, they are. But what happens is with acceptance comes resistance, right? So you gotta pick on someone. So why not pick on little baby trans people? Cause that's who we're picking on today, right? So I, I'll say, um... One action you can also do is continue to work with your ERGs, continue to work with your DNI teams and HR teams. Um, we also agree that HR can be the, the spearhead, that front line that really navigates what is culture, people, inclusive strategies, and that sense of belonging in organizations. HR can be the champions of not just the, the policies and um, sometimes HR gets the bad rap of being the police of the organization, but they can actually be proactive and get in front of these topics to allow for the opportunities for folks to grow and learn and do exactly what we're doing today, create fireside chats for hearing about stories of many marginalized communities. I wanna be thoughtful to time and just get a couple of, of last bullets in. First and foremost, thank you to Irene and Samantha for sharing their stories, being present, being open, sharing all of their dimensions of diversity. And you can absolutely get in touch. You can contact HMI, you can contact ourselves at Saderman Connect. You can contact Irene and Samantha directly to get them into your organizations to continue to amplify their message and connection. Um, HMI specializes, it is, it is part of our secret sauce in taking care of our LGBTQ young people uh, through the lens of mental well-being, mental health, and all the services that wrap around the ways that we can lift up our community, lift up stories, and lift up connection um, to our broader organizations and communities. And so um, definitely a big thank you to the HMI organization for all the work in championing events like this. Um, some takeaways from today. One is representation matters. You can't learn about something if you don't hear about it, see about it, and, and understand it with more detail. You can think about five ways to really impact your organization through learning questions and interviews, like how would you like to be addressed? 
what are your pronouns? Creating connections for folks to unify and learn about each other. Allyship is supporting people at all times. It's when folks are not in the room or when you don't think they're in the room that you can be the most powerful. Never out someone. You wouldn't want your invisible dimensions of diversity on displayed unless you allowed that safe space to happen. And so just like you have things that are part of your dimensions of diversity, how do you support and respect others' dimensions of diversity? And within that, transitioning is personal. Just like all mental well-being or all parenthood or all the being any of the dimensions of diversity that you are is yours and is unique to you, so is somebody's transitioning in the workplace. And so there is no one solve. There is no one lever. There is open-mindedness, growth mindset, leading with emotional intelligence, and not being afraid to ask a question to be thoughtful. And that leads to the last piece of recap from today, which is context matters. And sometimes you may not want to just lean on Google. You might want to ask a question. How can you ask if it's a safe space to ask that question, to create a deeper connection, to form a relationship? And by forming a deeper connection, you change the intentionality of your question into impact, into building bridges, into honoring somebody's story. We hope you will join us again on May 3rd to learn more about the impacts of mental health and mental well being specific to the LGBTQIA young people community and, and those impacts on workforce and workplace. So please join us again on May 3rd. And don't forget, we are an organization that needs your support. So don't be afraid to share our, our hmi.org website, donate, share, give back, and support the HMI message um, all over this wonderful ability for us to grow and learn through social media and everything else. So hmi.org, give back, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on May 3rd. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having us.